What we're going to do right now is what we always do. Um, we open up the scriptures, we uh, he hear stories or teachings of Jesus that lead us into a time of worship and taking the bread and the cup together. And so I invite you to grab a Bible or turn it on, whatever you do, and uh, go to Matthew chapter 21 with me. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, open with a reading t to you from a love poem. Do you guys le read love poetry? I don't really. <laughs> I don't really. Um, but you know me. Uh, uh, the, you know, I'm a Bible nerd, and there's actually quite a lot of love poetry in the Bible. A lot of it. Um, so I won't tell you where this line's from, and I'll let some of you guess, and we'll find out who else is a Bible nerd here. But this is the opening of a famous love poem in the Bible. I will sing for the one I love. A song about his vineyard. Anybody? It's kind of a leading question. It's really a trick question because some of you, yeah, you know your Bible some, and you know that there's a whole book of semi-erotic love poetry in the Bible. Uh, it's called the Song of Songs, or also called the Song of Solomon, and uh, the garden imagery is all metaphorical for different things, and so here you go. Uh, I'll sing a song about, about his vineyard, um, but, but you're wrong. You're wrong if you thought Song of Songs. This is a good one. Do you know there's other love poems? Other love poems in the Bible. Um, this one is written by uh, a prophet, the Hebrew prophet uh, named Yeshahu, Yeshahu ben Amot, um, or in English we refer to him as Isaiah, son of Amos. And uh, in Isaiah chapter 5, uh, he composed this short, compact love poem that is a parable that actually summarizes uh, what he sensed as his own calling and message to the people of Jerusalem. And this is the poem. I will sing a song for the one I love, a song about his vineyard. So the I, here's the poet, Isaiah. The beloved, well, just pay attention to who you think the beloved is. A song about his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up. He cleared it of stones. He planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it. He cut out a wine press as well. And then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only rotten fruit. It's not even that like the fruit sat there too long and rotted. It yielded rotten fruit. Now, Isaiah says, you who live in Jerusalem and people of Judah, why don't you judge between me and my vineyard? Tell me what I ought to do. Next, next slide. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have already done for it? I mean, I looked for good grapes. Why did it yield only rotten? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do for my vineyard. I'll take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. Last part is my favorite part. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel. And the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice. Don't pay attention to the gibberish yet. We'll talk about that. He looked for justice, but saw only bloodshed. He looked for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. The parable, love poem of Yeshahu ben Amos. Do you get it? Do you get it? Um, this, this was the difficult message that Isaiah son of Amos had to bear towards his people that he believed and was accusing the leaders and the people of Israel, they had so squandered the opportunity God gave them to become a light to the nations, that uh, they had so forfeited their responsibility that the time was up, and that the moment of decision has passed, that uh, judgment day, the day of God's justice is coming. And this is a difficult message, because Isaiah was like a really prominent person 
He was well known by politicians and kings in Jerusalem. People didn't like his message, got him in trouble, uh, but he felt called to speak it to the leaders of, of Israel. And so he used every poetic tool in his arsenal, his literary arsenal, <laughs> to communicate to his people. So he uses love poetry and parable and wordplay. Did you see by, did you see the end there? This is so brilliant. This is Yeshahu ben Amotz at his best right here. So, so the whole point is God, God planted his covenant people. He rescued them out of slavery in Egypt. He brought them into the land promised to Abraham. He would plant them there. He gave them abundance. He gave them the, the laws of the Torah that they would be shaped by God's justice and generosity to become a light to the nation. This is Isaiah's language. That they would be a light to the nations. That they would be the city on the hill. That the nations would look to these people who would be shaped by God's love and, and see what human communities ought to really be like. And so God planted the vineyard, and he looks for the grapes, and what does he see? He's just stinky grapes, stinky, rotten grapes. That's the metaphor. But when Isaiah cashes it out, right, l literally, he says God comes to the vineyard looking for fruit. What's he looking for? He's looking for justice. What's he looking for? He's looking for, for righteousness. So he's looking for the, these communities of Israel. Righteousness, we'll start with the, with the third term right there. It's a tzedakah. Righteousness is a, is a key, key word in the Old Testament scriptures to describe relationships, healthy, right relationships. That's what the word means, right relationships. That people of whatever their differences, you know, social, economic, class, ethnicity, gender, it doesn't matter, that there be right, equitable, fair relationships in Israel. And justice, that's tzedakah, justice up there at the top, mishpat, are the actions, specifically legal actions, that judges or the people were to take when tzedakah was violated. So when people are abusing each other, or mistreating them, or cheating one another, there's no tzedakah. So you do mishpat. It's the action that you take to create tzedakah and to make things right once more. And so God comes to his people that he planted out of his love and generosity, and he looks for, he looks for mishpat, but what does he find? Mizpach. He looks for mishpat, but what he sees is mizpach. And he looks for tzedakah, righteousness, but what does he actually find? Tzedakah. Tzedakah. Come on. It's good. It's good, isn't it? Really, look at that. That's, that's beautiful. And, I, and this is the thing about parables and poems. Some people might think, like, why, don't you, why didn't they just say what they really meant? But, but parable and poetry actually communicates more than what is meant, right? I mean, it's the thing about the parables and poetry. It invites you in, and there's ambiguity and a surplus of meaning. And so what, what's, there's something about human communities where the, what the, the distance between a community of people living in Sedekah and Mishpat is just one letter different from becoming a community of Mishpach and Sedekah. Right? It's a fine line between the two. It's beautiful. And this, this was the message of Yeshahu ben Amotz. And he used love poetry to, to communicate it in parable. And he wasn't the last one to do so. We uh, have been following for a year now the career of another Israelite prophet whose name is very close. Uh, it's not Yeshahu, uh, but it's from the same Hebrew root, Yeshua. Yeshua Minatzeret, Jesus who is from Nazareth. And he has a similar message. He's, he sees himself as another Isaiah, 700 years later, coming to the leaders of Jerusalem to hold them accountable for their mismanagement of God's vineyard. And that introduces us to the parable we're looking at here today. Uh, we're in Matthew chapter 21, and just hold this poem in your, in your mind and its language, and you'll see why I read it to you. Jesus is in Jerusalem, if you've been following with us. Jesus, just like Isaiah, confronts the leaders in Jerusalem. And actually, in this moment, we're going to look at a parable that starts in verse 33 of Matthew 21. But the, the, he's in this long conversation that we're taking like four weeks to unpack, <laughs> but it's just with one co confrontation. If you go back to verse 23 in Matthew 21, if you go back to verse 23, Jesus had entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him and said, essentially, you know, who do you think you are? 
smarty pants, right? Well, actually, no, not smarty pants. I mean, he just came in to the temple in Jerusalem and disrupted everything, right? You remember, he was like, he acted like he owns the place. He's acting like a king. And they're ticked because they run the place, right? And Jesus disagrees. And so he does, pulls the stunt, remember, turning over the tables in the temple, and they're ticked off. So then they confront and challenge him. Who do you think you are? And first, Jesus it does pull a smarty pants move because he's like, I'll answer your question if you answer mine. You know? And then, you know, they can't answer his question. He's like, yeah, I thought so. And then he goes on to tell them three parables. Three parables. And we're looking at the second one here today. But just so, I mean, the, the, the parables are all connected in a flow of thought. They're all about why and how and what the results will be of Israel's leaders rejecting Jesus and the kingdom of God movement. So, oh, sorry, let's go back to that. Go back. Here we go. So the first parable Josh explored last week, it was the two sons. The father, there's a father who asks his sons to go work in a vineyard, the family vineyard. And the first son says, yeah, of course I will. And then he walks out and he's like, oh, that's a lot of work. I want to watch TV or something. And so they, so he, doesn't, he doesn't actually go work. And then the second son says, like, no, I don't want to work. And then he sees his other brother on the couch and he's like, oh, I don't want to be like him. And so he goes out and works anyway. The TV part was my addition. So, he, uh, but there you go. And so he actually does the right thing. And then he says, you leaders of Jerusalem, you are like the rebellious son. You've rejected the offer. The second parable we're looking at today is about Jesus is telling in parable form what's happening in the moment as these leaders reject Jesus. The third parable that uh, Tom, who was up here earlier, he's going to help us explore next week is the parable of the wedding banquet where Jesus is talking about the rejection of the messengers that he then will send on after him. But all, of, all three of these parables are exploring what's going on in the hearts and the minds of God's people as they reject their Messiah. Verse 33, let's hear, let's hear this parable. Listen to another parable, Jesus says. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it. He dug a wine press in it. He built a watchtower in it. Come on, come, come now. Really? Do you see it? It's right there. I mean, it's, it's a virtual quotation from Isaiah's love poem. <laughs> right? The poem of the God of Israel singing to his beloved Israel how they've broken his heart, how they've produced rotten fruit. So here again, Jesus, there's another Isaiah talking about an owner and a vineyard. But the focus here, Jesus is a, a poet of his own. He's not just going to copy. So this isn't going to be about the rotten fruit. This is going to be about the rotten farmers. So he, he planted a vineyard, put a wall around it, wine press, watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some other farmers. And then he moved on to another place. So think, think here... This is as familiar in our day as it was in theirs. Where this is like an investment property. So somebody makes an investment in a vineyard, sets it all up perfect, and then hands it over to be cultivated by these vine growers, these, these farmers, we could call them, or tenants, as they're called in this, in this translation. So it's very common. There you go. Set up. Day-to-day -day situation. Verse 34. Now, when the harvest time approached, he sent his servant to the tenant to collect his fruit. Who's been cultivating the vines so that they will produce the, the fruit? Who's putting in the work? Farmers. Whose fruit is it? It's the owner's. <laughs> it's, like it's his land. He invested it in the land, purchased it, invested it. Do you see? It's his, they work it, but it's his fruit. There's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's right, right? That's just. But the tenants seized his servants. They beat one, they killed another, and they stoned the third. Now, if you know the parable, just pretend like you don't. <laughs> but, oh, what? What on earth is going on? But it's really, ex it's like bad soap opera now at this point. It's like, what is happening here? There's a mutiny, right, on the farm. In the vineyard. So what does the owner do? I, okay, I'll send some more. This is one of those parables where it's a day-to-day -day situation that Jesus describes. 
Then all of a sudden it gets really intense. Is he referring to some, you know, situation that they would have known? Uh, pr probably not. Is he referring to something that many uh, hired workers wish they could do? Probably. Probably. Uh, uh, w everything we know about Galilee in Jesus' day is nobody was honoring the family land set up from uh, the laws of Israel where like people couldn't lose their land. Uh, everything we know about the economics of the farming territory, it's still a rich farming country till, still today, but it was being bought out by wealthy landowners, many of whom were not even Jewish. They were living in Rome, they're living in Caesarea, and they just are buying up all of the land while the people whose ancestral land it is are now working on their own land but as hired workers. And they wish they could kill the owners. So he's tapping into some Freudian dream of the people or something like that. But that's, that's the image here. So it's really intense. They kill, they kill the servants. So what does he, he do? He sends more servants. I think that's logical. Maybe he should send them armed, but he doesn't because more than the first time, but the tenants treated them the same way. So it's this bloody massacre now, the owner has this mutiny to deal with. He has he's hired these farmers, and they're, they're killing his people. It's just, it's, this is not oppressive. He, he, he hired them to work the farm, and just rebellion and mutiny. Last of all, verse 37, he sent his son to them. Now, you might think, boy, this guy's stupid. <laughs> like, so, so it's a parable, right? So just, the, just don't miss the point here. So he sends his son. The son is act, has the most authority of all, right? The son's like the embodiment of the family authority and the father's authority and the estate and so on. And so he says, surely they'll respect my son, he said. Now, stop. Um, the prophets and the poets of Israel love to tell love poems. They love to write poetry. They love to make word plays. Um, the word son in Hebrew, um, anybody? It's a Hebrew word that you know, but you probably don't know that you know it. Ben, anybody, any Bens in the room? Cheers, Ben. You're a star in this parable. <laughs> Except you get killed. <laughs> Sorry. So, uh, Ben. Ben. Just tuck that away. Uh, so the father sends the Ben, but the Ben is, is rejected and murdered. So here we go. Here's, here's how it goes down. Verse 38. When the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, oh, this is the best. Best situation that could have happened. Come on, let's kill, kill the Ben and take his inheritance. So they took him, they threw him out of the vineyard, and then they killed him. Now you, now you might think that they're stupid uh, because how, you're going to kill someone and that's how you get their inheritance? Is he carrying it in a bag with him? Maybe the vineyard is the inheritance. Maybe that's what's good. They'll take control of the vineyard. Uh, we don't know. I, th I think part of the... What's happening here? Jesus is telling this story maybe about what some farmers wish that they could do to get back their land from the wealthy landowners who live in Rome. But there's something within the story right here. It's like they've, something shifted. How on earth do hired workers who signed a contract that says, yes, I will work here for you know, six months or whatever and then you know, produce as much fruit as I possibly can for the owner? How does a worker go from that mindset, totally a fair contract, to then killing any representatives of the owner and then killing family members so that we can have this vineyard that belongs to us? What's happening here? And th the fact that Jesus doesn't paint in the details, it's part of this parable. He invites you to participate in the meaning of the, how, what's happening here? Somehow, we don't know how, somehow these farmers have gotten it in their minds that this vineyard actually should belong to them. And, and then they begin to foster this delusion, and this delusion that it actually is theirs motivates this really irrational, violent behavior to kill, kill people, <laughs> and then to kill the son of the owner of the vineyard. Something's shifted in their thinking. 
they think it's theirs. It's not. I mean, it's not their vineyard, very clearly. You know, it's not their land. Um, likely, it's not even their own tools that they're working with or like houses that they're staying with. It's, none of it's theirs. It doesn't belong to them. But they've come to think that it ought to and that it is. Jesus finishes the parable by asking a question. Verse 40, he says, so when the owner of the vineyard comes, so he sent servants, then he sent his Ben, now the owner himself is going to come. And then Jesus doesn't close it himself, he actually pitches it to his listeners. He says, so what will he do to those tenants? You tell me, what should he do? What should he do? Well, you don't have to say what you really think. I don't know, maybe you're embarrassed to say it, I don't know. But uh, the people who are listening to him, and who are the people listening to him? The chief priests and the Pharisees who said, who do you think you are? They, you know, so they're enveloped in the story now, and they're like, well, of course, he's going to, look at this, they're gonna, he's going to bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied. And then, so they're going to face justice. And then he's going to rent the vineyard to some other tenants, other farmers, who will give him his share of the fruit or the crop at harvest time. So let's not forget, like this, this whole thing's about fruit. The owner invested in vineyards to produce fruit. So one way or another, the fruit's going to happen. Those farmers didn't work out. It re like really, really didn't work out. So we're going to get some new farmers who are going to produce the fruit. How you guys doing? Do you get it? Maybe it took a few minutes to process Isaiah's parable. Now we're processing Jesus' parable to the same type of person, the leaders of Jerusalem. Do you get it? So let's just pause for a moment. So let's um, take stock of the parable, what you think it is, popular vote. <laughs> What's the vineyard? Okay, we'll answer that one later, apparently. Uh, uh, who are the farmers? Who are the farmers? So the leaders of Israel, right? The priests, the Pharisees, the leaders of Israel. Good job. Um, who are the servants? Yeah, so here, again, this is, you know, Jesus is a Bible geek too. So one of the most common ways the prophets of Israel were referred to, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, were my servants, the prophets. God, God calls them all over uh, the Old Testament. And he, and he sends the prophets to his people as servants who will warn Israel, accuse them of mispach and tzedakah and, and so on, and call them to mishpat and tzedakah, justice and righteousness. Um, who's the son? We should all get that one right. We should all. Who's the ben? Ben obviously represents, so it's, Jesus is presenting himself as the culmination of the owner trying to communicate to his people, and it's actually the very embodiment of the Father. So what does this mean, and who are the other tenants? What does it mean that they're going to face justice and that the vineyard will be given over to other farmers? Well, Jesus kind of explains, but he explains by quoting even more ancient Hebrew poetry. Verse 42, Jesus said to them, have you never read, <laughs> have you read your Bibles? I'm sorry, it's every week. I've gotten these like three messages in a row, but it doesn't get old. Have you read your Bibles? He says to the Bible scholars. And then he quotes from another ancient poem. If, well, I'll just read it. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Where's he quoting from? If you, if you should have a little footnote, probably. Psalm 118. Psalm 118 is what he's quoting from there. And as with Jesus, he, he's got the whole poem in his head, and he assumes you do too. So here we have, uh, so you go read Psalm 118. It's a remarkable poem. Uh, it was a poem that was actually sung along Psalms 113 through 118. They're called the Great Hallel. And they were sung in the temple liturgy, we know, uh, every, uh, all throughout Passover week, which is precise. So Jesus quotes a poem that is being recited every day, in the temple, and it's a poem about this individual. It doesn't say they just are called the I. They call themselves I. And it's an individual who undergoes great suffering because of persecution from enemies. And he calls out to God, save me, deliver me. And God delivers 
the suffering one of Psalm 118. He vindicates him and exalts him over his enemies. And then as the poet reflects back on how God vindicated him, he uses a metaphor of stones and quarries and cornerstones and rejected rocks. So here's, uh, so here's the image, just, get, just to get a picture in your head. Um, so this is a, a picture of uh, the southwest corner of the walls that still to this day support the Temple Mount, uh, what was the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. So if you stand right at the foot of this, these are 2,000 year old stones, and you look up, it's about like four, three or four stories up, and then up there is the huge plaza where the Dome of the Rock is today, and where the temple uh, was in Jesus' day. And this was a major intersection in the city, and there were sh uh, shops and so on all along this, so, so, here's, so here's my point. <laughs> these are 2,000-year-old these are stones of a, as a part of a wall that was built, like Jesus certainly walked by these stones in this intersection when he went into the temple. And these stones were actually architected, commissioned by King Herod, the Herod that cried, tried to kill Jesus when he was a baby and killed the babies in Bethlehem. And just look at the... Just look at the steps. Just get the dimensions of it. Think of, put yourself walking down those steps, the really big stone steps, and just, do you see the size of that cornerstone? Do you see it? I mean, just put it, you know, if you put yourself on the steps, it's like this, about this tall and this wide. It's almost a perfect square on that side, and then it's about 15 feet long. Look at that massive stone. And these would be the, pr these would be the best stones because they're on display in a way that none of the other stones are. It's the cornerstone. So the poem is inviting us into a little, another little parable almost, where imagine all of these stones before they were carved out, super smooth and so on, and they're at the rock quarry, and it's like a rough, huge, massive, rough boulder. And there's a whole bunch of them, and the architect is invited. You know, they've been hewn out of the rock, and then the builders are like, invite him to come inspect the stones. And so the builder's going like, yes to that one. Yes, yeah. ooh, um, crack, you know, has all this other stuff in there. No, no, that one's bad. Throw it out. This one, yes. This one, yes. That's the scene right here. And so this poem, the poet depicts himself as a rejected stone. The builders... The builders have looked at the stone and say, no, it's ugly, it's compromised, it's cracked, it's not going to be the showcase stone. But in reality, the poet says, no, in God's eyes, yeah, that's the one. It's totally the one. And the stone that the builders have rejected is the stone that God will make the showcase. It's and it's not just going to be in the wall, it's going to be the cornerstone and if it's near the bottom, then that means it's a stone that is so strong it can hold the weight of the whole edifice, the whole structure right there. Do you see what's happening in the little stone parable right here? Okay, now, this is brilliant. Jesus is brilliant. Because um, the word for stone in Hebrew, wait for it, eben, eben. Do you get it? <laughs> it's great. It's beautiful. Um, and it almost works in English, because look, S-O-N here, but somehow the T just doesn't. It would be better if it was sun, like S-U-N, but you can't have a rejected sun. We can't reject the sun in the sky that we would all die. So there you go. Anyway, but it works in Hebrew. Works in Hebrew. So this is a, Jesus is telling a, a story about the rejected Ben. And then he quotes from another poem that has its own parable about a rejected Eben. And in both cases, in both cases, it's this crazy re reversal. In, in the first case, it's a parable about the, the ludicrousy of these farmers to reject the Ben and to murder him. And in this poem, it's also about the, the sadness, the tragedy of the, reject, of the builders rejecting, because actually, in reality, that was the most important stone all along. Do you have ears? We should listen. We should listen. That's not me. That's Jesus, by the way. <laughs> so, so how is the rejected 
Ben and Eben going to, what does that mean? The son was killed, the Ben was killed, but the Eben gets, the, the decision of the builders is reversed. So what, what does that mean about the farmers and their murder of the son? What, what does it all mean, Jesus? Verse 43. Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce what? Fruit. Because that's what this is all about, <laughs> producing fruit. Who's the you? Therefore I tell you the kingdom of God is taken away from you. Who's the you? So again, who is he talking to? Right? So to go, you have to just trace back, back, back. All of a sudden, Jesus entered the temple courts. He was teaching the chief priests, the elders, of the, the leaders of the people of Israel. So I, Jesus sees himself as another Isaiah. The, le the leaders of the people, they were called to to curate and steward the temple, the meeting place of heaven and earth where God met with his people. They were called to teach the people the laws of the Torah that would guide Israel to become the light to the nations, to become the city on the hill, and to show everybody else what God designed human communities to look like, at least in their day and in their context. And they just botched the job. They botched the job horribly. They did in Isaiah's day, and they did in Jesus' day. And so he's calling them to account. And he says, you guys lost your opportunity. And the kingdom of God, the place, the place in the community where God reigns over his people, you don't, it's a new regime. You're, you're being ousted from leadership and God's going to found a new building, a new, a new eben, a cornerstone, of a whole new temple structure. Uh, but this temple structure is not going to be a physical one. It's going to be the Ben. Do you get it? Do you get it? Do you remember uh, in the Gospel according to John when Jesus uh, goes into the temple and he pulls his stunt? And then they're like, what? What do you? Um, he says that the temple is going to be destroyed. And then they say, what? It took us so long to build this. And then he says, do you remember what he says? Um, holy cow, I'm quoting from it, and I don't remember what it says right now. <laughs> this is such poor form. I didn't know I was going to... Here we go. Here, that's right. That's right. I'll get the wording right. Destroy this temple, and I will raise it up again in three days. Thank you. Thanks for bearing with me on that one. And then John whispers in our ear and says, the temple he was speaking about was himself. It's the Ben, the Eben. Yeah, but Jesus, in Jesus' mind, he's here to restart God's covenant people. The, the, the job's been botched. He comes as the, as the king of Israel, and he's going to restart the covenant people of God. And he's going to call the leaders of Israel to account. He's, what he's not saying right here is that somehow the people of Israel as a whole, yeah, you're done. We're going to do this new thing called the church. No, 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 no. Jesus, he's the Messiah of Israel. And who's following right, him right now? Lots of people. What's their ethnicity? They're all Jewish, <laughs> and they actually will continue to be for a couple decades. Jesus is, is reconstituting the covenant people of God around himself as its leader. And this, this people group was always meant to be a people group and a family that would encompass and wrap its arms around the nations, but it is a is a Jewish messianic movement, which is why Christianity, as, throughout much of its history, Christians have been trying to distance themselves from their Jewish heritage, and it's like cutting off the branch that you're sitting on, literally, or metaphorically. Go read Romans 11. Anyway, so, so here's, here's the point. Jesus, he's, he's uh, appointing himself as the new leader of the covenant people because they botched the job. And then he gets really intense. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken, verse 44. Everyone who falls on the ebon will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. Holy cow, Jesus. <laughs> so, so once again, we don't have time to go in. We have been talking about rocks for far too long this morning already, but he's actually quoting from Isaiah again, chapter 8, and Daniel chapter 2. He's, he's, he's predicting the destruction of Jerusalem because they've rejected their Messiah. Let me close it down. Verse 45. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, 
they realized, oh, he was talking about them like a man. <laughs> Have you ever been in a conversation where you realize you've been insulted, but like 20 seconds ago? <laughs> you know what I mean? You're like, oh, I'm so, I didn't get it. Now I look extra stupid. Worth being insulted. Anyway, so that's what, like, just imagine the scene. It's like they, oh, what? You know? And so they look for a way to arrest him. We already know they've set in motion a plan to murder him. They were afraid of the crowd because the, the people believed that he was what? A prophet. And a prophet he, he was. So, so how are you guys doing? So Jesus comes. He warns the people of Israel. He accuses them of total mismanagement of the kingdom of God. They had this opportunity to be brought into God's story and what God wanted to do in the world. And something happened inside their minds and their hearts and now they're going to murder the Ben and reject the Eben. But in reality, God's going to do something marvelous. And he's going to reverse their decision. And he's going to actually undo the murder by taking the rejected Eben and raising the Ben from the dead. It's beautiful how this whole passage works, works together. I've been... Um, uh, staring at this story for weeks now, um, wondering what on earth it has to say to us. <laughs> um, because, so just think about this. This is cool. I mean, I hope it, I'm trying to make it as lively and interesting as I possibly can. Uh, but who's Jesus talking to? I mean, he's talking to chief priests and elders of the people of ancient Israel. I've never been either of those. <laughs> Never been either. My hair makes me look like an elder, but uh, I've never, you know, like a, he's not talking to his disciples here. He's talking to the leaders of Israel. But go back to verse 43. Let's remind ourselves what all of the, the vineyard, the stone, the, the Pharisees, the elders, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce what? Fruit. What's this whole story? What is God's purpose in the world, in this, in this metaphor? To produce fruit. What kind of fruit? The fruit of the kingdom of God, right? Mishpat and tzedakah, <laughs> right relationships. God's, God's on a mission to somehow redeem and re restore and set right what we have made of his good world. And he's, and he's doing so through Jesus and the people and the family that, that Jesus is forming. And that's a fact, just put your thumb here or, or no, or not, but uh, go to the very last page of Matthew with me. Let's just see how all of this cashes out. The last sentences of the gospel according to Matthew. It's chapter 28. This is Jesus' parting words to his disciples. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Jesus came to his disciples. He's raised from the dead, and then he says to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. The, king, the kingdom of God, the reign and the rule of God over his people in this world has been taken away from you, chief priests and elders, and given to who has the authority over heaven and earth now? King Jesus. King Jesus. Therefore go, Jesus says to his farmers, make disciples of all of the nations, baptizing them, initiate them into the community in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to produce fruit. <laughs> or as he says it here, to obey everything I've commanded you. Now we've, you know, we're taking a year and a half to work through the Gospel according to Matthew, but just think through, in the Gospel according to Matthew, can you think through any of the places where Jesus has been teaching his disciples? Oh yeah, there was like we took four months to work through this thing called the Sermon on the Mount. It's a big block of Jesus' teaching. It's the first one in the Gospel according to Matthew. And it's like following Jesus 101, right? It's the whole thing about like loving your neighbor as yourself and treat people the way you want to be treated. It's bearing fruit for the kingdom. Justice and right relationships and forgiveness and, and sexual integrity and generosity an extreme loyalty and commitment to each other and our well-being and to the well-being of, of those around us in our city and in our communities. It's producing fruit. God's whole point is to form a people who will produce fruit. 
And so the warning to the leaders of Jesus' day is not directed at me, but there's, kind of, there's a warning implicit in it because the whole point is why is Jesus forming a new people? So that they will be the ones to produce fruit. And so the warning and the challenge, it comes right to us as his, as his disciples. What's the whole point of following Jesus? To produce, he wants to produce fruit in and through, in and through his people. And so here's where I want to just camp out as, as I close uh, and, to, and to lead us to the bread and the cup. Because all of a sudden, Israel, the, the leaders of Israel, their failure becomes a, its own parable of warning to us. What, what is it, how do you get into a mindset, all the way back to the, the, the farmers in the parable, how do you get to a place where you reject the Ben, <laughs> right? Where there's, there's someone who's invited you to be a part of their deal, but then you come to think of it as your deal. And then all of a sudden you see everything is owed to you and belonging to you, and then you start behaving in these ways that are totally irrational and destructive. And they don't make any sense, like how, what happened there? And in the parable, what happened is they, they ceased to see that this land, that this opportunity, that the tools they're using, that the vineyard, it doesn't belong to them, and it's not about them. They've been invited to participate in somebody else's story, and that someone else is on a mission to produce fruit. And the shift happens when all of a sudden I begin to view things as mine. That, that was their shift. They clearly, at some point, begin to see the vineyard as belonging to them. This is our, it's mine. And so I'll do whatever it takes to defend what is mine, because who's this guy, like, coming to claim the fruit? This is our vineyard. You see what's happening? That's the shift. And it, it seems to me, just speaking personally, right, like, what, what prevents, what, are the, what mindsets do I find myself in that prevent me from following the teachings of Jesus, and becoming apathetic in, as his disciple. And one, there's always many pieces to answer, answer that question, but one of them is really insightful. And it's, it's precisely this. It's that I forget that I've been invited to participate in Jesus' vineyard. And, and I come to see my life and my opportunities and my resources and my relationships as, as mine. If you think back to the Sermon on the Mount, one of the main themes that Jesus was constantly trying to help us cultivate is the sense that life is a gift. Remember his teachings about the flowers and the trees and anxiety and stress and worry and so on. And, and a key part of what he put his thumb on right there is the reason you're stressing out is because somehow you think like life is about you <laughs> and everything that you have belongs to you and is either owed to you and then when you don't have it, you're stressed or you're angry about it. And he just flips everything on its head and he just says, no, 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 like everything's a gift. Every, everything is a gift from the God that he called the generous father. So somehow it's when I stop, when I view my life as mine. And that seems silly for us to say because we're like, well, yes, it's, but it's my life. It is my life. Well, yeah, it kind of is, but it's actually kind of not. Like I wasn't, I wasn't owed to exist. It's actually very improbable that any of us should exist right now. We are aware of that, I hope. And that, you know, Wizard of Oz, it's a strange, weird movie or whatever, but like we're, we're living in something that for real is actually more strange than the Wizard of Oz, that any of us are even here right now. You know, having this, con having, oh, sorry, this is not a conversation, having this listening, listening to me speech or whatever. So, <laughs> but you know, like that we're, it's so, this is such a strange, remarkable world. It's not owed to me that I should exist, but somehow when I view my life as m mine, then, then the possessiveness begins. That's the delusion. It's the delusion. And so Jesus challenges us to, to cultivate this mindset every day. It's a gift. Every breath, it's a gift. The people in my life, the circumstances that I'm in, they're a gift. And with, with gifts come responsibility. Uh, Christmas is coming up, and I am not going to give my two toddler sons uh, their pocket knives because they would kill each other <laughs> with them and stab me in the leg. Certainly, if I were to give it to them, but I know, I, like I know, 
what I'm going to give them for their first pocket knives, because it'll be similar to the one I got and still use around the house. It's so handy, a little Swiss Army pocket knife. So, but, and with that gift, my dad had a conversation with me. This is for like, you know, like using the screwdriver for screws, buddy. You know? <laughs> and like using the knife to whittle sticks and make bows and arrows and that kind of thing, but not for shooting people, just the, like it, it comes, it's a gift that comes with responsibility. And the responsibility in this parable is to produce fruit. So just, like, let's just make this very practical. And this is just a very, it's a very practical thing to lead us into taking the bread and the cup. You have a job, most of you. <laughs> and uh, whether you get paid for your job or not, you, you put your efforts towards something. Why are you in that job? I think Jesus would ask you. Why are you there? You may love the job. You may hate the job. When it comes to this matter, I'm, I actually don't think Jesus cares. I think what he cares about is do I view this job as a gift? And do I view it as an opportunity to love God, to love my neighbor, to love these people that I work with, and to produce fruit for the kingdom? Um, you, all of us, are in a family of some kind. It's your family. <laughs> you may love your family. You're going to be spending probably a lot of time with them over the next month. Uh, you may hate your family. And I think Jesus would urge us to see our families as part of the gift, part of the vineyard that he has called us to work in to produce fruit. By doing what? By obeying everything that I commanded you, loving God and loving your neighbor. Uh, uh, some of you, most of you, have roommates or you live with your spouse. You may love that setup. You may hate it. Jesus wants us to see it as a gift. It doesn't, the, the set of circumstances doesn't belong to me. I don't own any of this. These aren't my people. It's not my house. It's not your job. <laughs> it's a gift. It's a gift. And, you, and we've been hired to work in the vineyard to produce fruit. But the moment, that I, the moment I see this, everybody owes me, God owes me, this is mine, it just all goes downhill. And that's the delusion that Jesus exposes in this parable. So here's uh, what I'd encourage us to do as we go into the bread and the cup. And, and as we take the bread and the cup, we're eating the parable of the rejected Ben, who gave his life as an act of love and sacrifice for people who reject him all the time because he loves us and he's committed to us. And, he, and the rejected Ben becomes the vindicated Eben who despite our rejection, God vindicates and brings back to life because he loves us and he's committed to us. And he's committed to you. Whether you live in the delusion or whether you're trying to wake up to reality from the delusion, he loves you and he's committed to you. And so as we take the bread and the cup, let's, let's just ask, like very practical, ask Jesus to bring the family member to your mind that you hate and, or that you don't like, that you're estranged from, and you're likely going to be around them in the next month. What are you going to do? How can you produce fruit for the kingdom? Get the work coworker or the work scenario in your mind you hate the situation, you don't like the person, what are you going to do? And Jesus would encourage us, I think, to see it as a gift and as an opportunity to produce fruit. Um, so I'm going to pray for us, just that Jesus will guide us and give us wisdom as we worship him and take the bread and the cup. Let me close in a word of prayer.